this one, this one. Before we begin, uh, there has been some news coming in. I'm not sure it's, if it's verified just yet of some troubles in the north of the country with uh, a jalous that was taking place. If it is the case, uh, and even if it's not, then for any of the other of our marhumin who have died in the way of Aba Abdullah al Hussein, wherever they may be in the world, for all of our shuhada, for all of our ulama who are no longer with us, for all of the marhumin of those who are here present, and all of the mu'minin and mu'minat, wherever they may be, rahim Allahu man qara'a surat al-Fatiha. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, alhamdulillah, rabbil alameen ar-Rahim. أعوذ بالله من الشيطان اللعين الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على أشرف الأنبياء والمرسلين خاتم النبيين سيدنا ونبينا وحبيب قلوبنا وطبيب نفوسنا أب القاسم المصطفى محمد اللهم صل على محمد وعلى أهل بيته الطيبين الطاهرين المأسومين المذلومين واللعنة الله على أعدائهم من الآن إلى قيام يوم الدين وصلى الله عليك يا سيدي ويا مولاي يا حجة الله يا ابن الحسن يا صاحب الأسر والزمان اللهم صل على محمد وعلى My dearest elders, brothers, sisters, السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته in the first two nights, we've taken a step back from the hustle of day-to-day -day life. We've reassessed in what direction we've been traveling in all these years. We've checked using the litmus test of Imam al Hussein salam whether our direction of travel is going in the right way or the wrong way. We've even recalibrated the direction in case it was wrong by redefining our purpose last night. And hopefully, perhaps we've admitted that we've got some work to do on ourselves. Perhaps we've reached that conclusion where we've looked in the spiritual mirror and said, you know what, fair enough. I probably need to admit I've got some work to do on myself. Now maybe two nights of reflection, you guys are sick of reflection. I know I usually hear Sadiq, make it a little bit more practical, you know? I need some practical tips. Uh, I don't know how practical we'll get today, but we're certainly gonna change theme and topic. So what's the plan for today? We're changing the angle a little bit more. And to introduce the angle for today, I'm gonna share a few statistics with you that I find quite startling. And that is that according to Action Against Hunger, 829 million people still go hungry in the world. That's 10% roughly of the global population. And one of the biggest causes behind this hunger and poverty pandemic that we face across the world is conflict i.e. wars between countries. And in 2020, it was the primary driver for hunger for 99.1 million people in 23 countries. Just conflict alone, i.e. if you were to say, oh, maybe there was floods, okay, is that man-made or not? Oh, maybe there was too much heat, so the crops died and we don't have enough food. And I know a lot of you will say, no, Sadiq, there's plenty of food to go around. But even if you were to say that, and if we were to isolate a man-made cause for sure for why there could be a global hunger crisis in the world, conflict would be one of them. The US is spending on post 9-11 terror wars alone is over eight trillion dollars. 11 years, sorry, 21 years. 
trillions of dollars, according to the Watson Institute of Brown University. And global giving estimates that in order to solve world hunger, it would be between quite a big range, seven billion to 265 billion dollars. So to solve global hunger, seven to 265 billion dollars. Let's take the upper angle, 265 billion. Compare that to the US, who, as we just said, have spent over eight trillion dollars since 9-11 on post-terror related wars. Just the US is spending on that alone, it's a mere 3% to solve global hunger. So this question that keeps coming up around if Allah is so merciful, then why does suffering exist in the world? Which is not our topic for this evening. I think you can start to see just how man-made some of our problems are. But what I, the reason why I wanted to share these statistics was basically to conclude with you all to start the premise of our discussion to say that the world, frankly, is in a bit of a mess. We had a bit of a giggle yesterday about how can we be in such a world whereby Boris Johnson and Donald Trump can be elected. We're now seeing the amount of world hunger that, are, that exists across the world. We're now seeing the, the rise of the far right in many different countries. We're seeing the rise of atheism. We're seeing the rise of same gender relationships and how far that will go. I don't think we really want to explore, but we recognize that the world is in a bit of a mess, a real dire constraint. And there's probably many other indicators that we could use to illustrate that the world isn't working perfectly, but let's just suffice to say it's not going very well. Now, we as the Shia of Ali Muhammad, as Ifni Ashar believers, we have conviction, or so we should, that our Messiah, our awaited Savior, the 12th of the infallibles, will solve this crisis and bring about perfect society, a global, cosmic, perfect society. And we learn this specifically from a hadith from our dear Prophet Muhammad Mustafa sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam. Allahumma salla ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad wa ajab. Where he's reported to say if there was naught or if there was nothing left in the world but one day, God would extend that day until a man of my progeny emerges to fill the earth with justice and equity after it has been filled with injustice and inequality. And I think we'd all probably agree the world right now is pretty full of injustice and inequality, thereby we're waiting. According to this hadith from the Holy Prophet, we are waiting for this Messiah, for this final Imam to reappear and establish a society that is truly just, that is truly fair and that is ultimately perfect. Now, if each of us in this room truly believed in this concept, I'm sure that we'd each be working our socks off to prepare the grounds for our awaited savior and for this beautiful revolution that is to come about. However, in reality, some of us may find that this concept of a savior, whilst we may believe in it, because we were taught it at madrasa, if someone were to say, prove it to me, we'd be like, um, well, I mean, there's 12 Imams, right? Okay, well, that's not a proof. You're just stating me a claim. Oh, but you know, like it's, uh... and be honest with yourself. How many proofs can you reel off from the top of your head to say, you know what? If I was to be challenged by an individual, regardless of who they are, to say, look, you're putting all your hope in this awaited savior that's said to come and solve everything. Give me your proofs. Because they'll give you two, three, four, five, six that they believe are strong proofs to say this is nonsense. And if we're not able to rebuttal them, we'll start to see this pillar of Mahdawism within our faith start to crumble. And one thing that if we manage to have this yaqeen, this conviction, not just of the intellect, but also of the soul, that this is a definite reality, Perhaps it can be the catalyst for the change that we've realized we need in ourselves that we discussed in the first two nights. That if I know that the Imam is imminently set to arrive, and if I truly want to be amongst the Ansar, then those things that I remembered in the last two nights, that you know what, Sadiq, I need to work on myself on those things. Now I've got a real catalyst to go and work hard on them. But if I don't believe, and if I don't have this conviction truly, that the Imam is soon to come, then I'll be like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Later on in my life, inshallah, one day I will get there. So inshallah, tonight our plan is to try and establish the proofs 
of the return of our awaited saviour and to prove it beyond reasonable doubt such that you leave this hall today insha'Allah with true conviction, with true yaqeen in your intellect and in your heart that I need to be getting ready for the imminent return of Al-Qa'im min Ali Muhammad Allahumma salla ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad We start with a surah that many of us know the first few lines of and I think many of you will even know the exact line we're going to be using This is Surah Al-Baqarah and it's the first three verses Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim alif lam Meme. ذلك الكتاب لا ريب فيه هدى للمتقين الذين يؤمنون بالغيب ويقيمون الصلاة ومما رزقناهم ينفقون. In the name of Allah, the most beneficent, the most merciful, Alif Lam Mim. This is the book. There is no doubt in it. It's a guidance to the God weary who believe in the unseen. This is a critical part. الذين يؤمنون بالغيب. They also maintain the prayer and spend out of what we have provided for them. Immediately in this surah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is telling us this ghayb, this unseen, do you believe in it? It's a haq, it's a reality. Do you believe in it? Can you establish the proofs behind these realities of the ghayb? Or are you taking a step back and just, yeah, I guess I'll believe in it one day. The unseen is everything that is not observed by mankind or empirically experienced through the senses. The senses of sight, smell, touch, etc. I.e. we can see the shape and movement of an individual through our sense of vision. But we can't see that person's soul. But we infer it exists based on the fact that the individual is alive. The soul is a thing of the unseen realm as we cannot empirically observe it. But suddenly... When that person lies dead, we're like, oh, something changed there. Something's left this individual. We can't see that soul, but we have belief in the ghayb. We have belief in the unseen. And Imam al-Sadiq comes forward to explain what this verse is referring to. When Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in Surah Al-Baqarah, this line that we've probably recited many times, when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talks about the hidden concept here, Imam al-Sadiq is reported to say this is referring to whoever acknowledges the truth of the emergence of Al-Qa'im. Very explicit. So early in the Quran, he goes on. He's reported to say the god wary are the followers of Ali ibn Abi Talib. The unseen is the absent proof i.e. Imam al-Mahdi during his occultation. The evidence of this meaning is the word of Allah and he refers to the Quran well, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Why has not some sign been sent down to him from his Lord? Say the knowledge of the unseen belongs only to Allah. And here's the key point. So wait. I too am waiting along with you. So what's going on here? The Imam salam, alludes to two types of unseen. Two types of ghayb that are referred to in Surah Al-Baqarah. The first is the type that cannot and will never be empirically observable. Uh, will never be empirically observed. You and I will never be able to see it in this realm. That is one type of ghayb. We'll only see it in the next realm perhaps. The second type of ghayb is one that eventually at some point will become empirically observable and a reality at some point. For example, our awaited savior. Right now, he's in ghayb. Right now, we may not be able to physically see him. But one day, according to the Imam, we will be able to see him. And that line in the Quran where it says, the knowledge of the unseen belongs only to Allah. So wait, I too am waiting along with you. Allah is being clear here in saying, we wait for this specific ghayb. We wait together for this specific ghayb. So from Quran, we've established that there is the concept of our awaited Savior, that he is in ghaybah and that Allah has prescribed that we should wait for this ghaybah to come to an end until this reality eventually manifests itself and we'll be able to empirically observe it. The Imam is one example of this type of concept. Now, we as the Shia, despite having this in the Quran, we have allegations against us. Some will say, oh, you Shia, you've created this idea of an awaited savior just in response to your history. Like you guys failed. It was a pretty disappointing history, to be honest. You know, the idea was that you could just latch onto some sort of hope to give some kind of 
spur to mankind that you know you'll be able to f survive despite all the adversity you know you're getting killed across the world you've been killed for so many years you've just created this concept of an imam that will one day come just to make you feel better about life so by the time you're dead at least you had some hope sorry it's not going to happen that's one allegation some kind of facetious people would put against us a second allegation that they may say is that you know you Shia scholars realized that the project of Ali Muhammad billah, failed because they never really managed to get to political power. Yes, Ali ibn Abi Talib got there, but in reality, it was just for a few years. The one, two, three really dominated it, and then after Ali anyway, it was a, you know, we got it back. And in reality, all your 12 Imams, or let's call it 11, they didn't really have much of an impact. Half of them spent a lot of time in prison. Fine, maybe Imam al baqir Imam al sadiq got to spread a lot of knowledge, but we were back on it from the seventh, all in prison, the majority of them. So you know what? You just created this idea of the Mahdi, this concept that he's going to come back just to make yourselves feel better that one day your faith is going to triumph. So I look to you, my dear brothers and sisters. How would you reply? What examples are you pulling out from the top pocket? Because if we can't respond to these, we're going to struggle to have this yaqeen that the Imam is truly coming back. Maybe even those arguments have already dislodged us. And maybe I've just done some damning effects and some of you are like, oh no, these random guys that we've been citing maybe have a point. Maybe we are just living in a bit of hope. Maybe this is all a fantasy. So how do we reply? There's three main themes to our reply. The first were very quick. The third one is a little bit longer. But inshallah, I hope if you can even take some notes on your phone, I don't know, this is about your awaited savior. This is about proving that your imam exists, is returning and will establish a society of absolute justice and equality. So if you'd like to understand these proofs, kindly offer a salawat ala Muhammad wa Ali Muhammad. Firstly, we'll say, look, all of these allegations are erroneous. Now, that's a claim. But just to make sure you were clear, we believe they're all erroneous. The idea of a messianic savior is not a mere creation of primal instincts. It's not just humans suddenly one day saying, you know what? I fancy just to make this concept. It's like a superhero story like you write when you're eight years old. No, it's not like that. There's a bit more to it. And how can we challenge these? The first rebuttal that we have is this. If the idea of an awaited savior is merely an instinctive reaction to oppression, then it probably should have been put forward by groups before the Shia. Or even groups side by side with the Shia. And many groups in history have been persecuted. So why is it just us, for example, and just a couple of other groups that now have this concept of a messiah? Many groups have had it. So if it was a primal response, they all would have had it. But only a select few really have it, and it's based from a scripture. All Muslims, in fact, believe in the idea of a Mahdi as a savior. You'll be able to find it in their books very clearly. The details have disagreements. There's no doubt about that. But those who believe in the Mahdi include Muslims who actually live in relative ease. Muslims who may not be Shia in their scriptures say that there is a concept of a Mahdi and they may be living under, for example, the rule of Saudi Arabia or Bahrain where they are part of the mainstream school and they're not under any oppression but they also still believe in a Mahdi. So this allegation that you put forward to say you've only created out of oppression, well, what about your fellow brothers in faith if you like? They seem to be all right, and they seem to believe in it. So, actually, we've negated that point. The second point that we put forward is that if it's true that this concept came about from the human psyche being under the pressures of failure and persecution, then the same must be true of everything in the unseen. That anything that exists in the ghayb within our faith, we've just created it out of panic. What do I mean? Some Marxists allege that the Prophet was a brilliant figure who convinced his followers of an unseen system, i.e. this entire faith, of reward and punishment and moral conduct,
claiming all matters are unseen and propaganda. That's what they say about our faith. We've just kind of made it up. The Prophet was a good liar and convinced us all and convinced a few billion people along the way. No Muslim would, of course, say, oh, yeah, that's a good argument. Oh, Marxist, thank you. They would turn around and be like, Marxist, actually, sit in your place. We have proofs to illustrate that this faith from the Holy Prophet is absolutely pure. We can show you the, the, the miracle of the Quran, so on and so on and so on. So if Muslims are happy to bat away that challenge against something that is unseen, then why suddenly when it comes to the concept of the Mahdi, the concept of the unseen now turns into panic? And if this same argument could be used, then tell me how many Muslims in the world believe in Yawm Al-Qiyamah? Have you seen Yawm Al-Qiyamah yet? No, it's hidden. One day it will manifest itself. Every Muslim has to believe in this day of resurrection, in their usul. So if you're suddenly now willing to say, oh yes, out of pressure, we create concepts like the Mahdi. Because it's in ghaib, we can't see it, therefore it must be fake. Okay, say the same for the Day of Judgment. Say the same for the soul. Well, no, of course we can't say that. In the same way, this line of argument against us, again, it holds no bearing. The third line of our response is split up in a few different sections. And in order to engage with this, I need you to become detectives. Oh yeah, detectives, okay? I don't know if you guys ever watched The Bill. It's a thing in the UK. I don't know if it ever came out. It was like the best police detective show ever. I don't know if you have an equivalent. But anyway, I'm not advocating soap operas either. So, it was pretty clean. I promise. I want you to put on the specs of a detective. Clean slate. You've been brought a case. And for these next set of proofs, for you to just make a rational observation as to whether you think there's enough proof on the table to say, yeah, you know what? There could be a concept as the Mahdi. He's probably going to return one day and he's probably going to restore justice and equality. So how are we going to do this? We're going to do this through the means of mathematical probability or more concretely, cumulative probabilities, i.e. when you have so many different examples at some point, when you put them all together and you add it, or it may not reach one definitively, but it's tending very close to one and therefore it must be statistically significant or what we call in like uh, in, 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 in Rajali studies, mutawato. Something has happened so many times, been reported so many times that when you look at all of it together, it's very likely that this must have happened. The more evidence, the greater the probability, etc. So, let's try and see where we go. The first piece of evidence we're going to put on the table to suggest that yes, there is a, an individual known as the Mahdi, etc, etc. Is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is so clear in the Quran that there must be an Imam for every single era. Loads of evidence. And just to give some of them, Surah number 13 verse number 7. إِنَّمَا أَنْتُمْ مُنْذِرٌ وَلِكُلِّ قَوْمٍ هَادٍ you, O oh Prophet, are only a warner and there is a guide for every people. Question, so who is the guide in our time? Genuinely, what are the options that we have? You, O oh Prophet, are only a warner and there is a guide for every people. Okay, who is the guide for our time? We could create a short list as to who they could be. The Shia would say, well, we have a divinely appointed guide and we've got a lineage that we can point towards. Who would you like to bring forward? Okay, you want to bring the king of Saudi Arabia? Okay, put him on the table. Or the prince of Saudi Arabia? Okay, put him on the table. You want to bring your prime minister? Okay, put him on the table. You can now choose which one you want to trust. Could be an easy decision. One's track record isn't so great. At all. There is going to be a guide for every people. What would the Ahl Sunnah perhaps say? I'm not sure. I'm not sure they would have a common stance as to who the guide of this current period would be. It would be interesting to understand who they would put forward. And remember, this is Quranic, so it's a question that we can ask. It's from a, the most primary source, if you like, that we have. A second example is in Surah number 17, verse number 71, where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, The day we shall summon every group of people along with their Imam. Okay, who is your Imam that you're going to be represented by? I know mine. I know that Allah is definitely going to give me one. Otherwise, he'd be lying in the Quran. Twice he's mentioned that I'm going to have a leader. So I need to make sure that there is one. And of course, the meaning of an imam here must be in reference to its real meaning, i.e. a divinely appointed leader, not just some random bloke that you've elected one day whilst everyone else is busy with more important matters. 
And in narrations we find supportive statements to suggest that there is a set of leaders that will always exist until the end of time. Namely, the hadith of Thakalain. Yes, it's been recorded with slight differences, but it's been captured by hadith books in all denominations. In Musnad, we see the wording, I leave amongst you two weighty things, one of which is greater than the other. The book of Allah, which is a bond extending between the heavens and the earth, and my household and progeny. The two will never separate until they reach me at the pond of paradise. I.e., so long as the Quran exists, there must be a person from the progeny to protect and uphold it. So who is that person in our time? We need to have an answer. Another line in Musnad. Whoever dies without acknowledging the Imam of his time dies the death of the age of ignorance. I.e. every single era must have an Imam. So tell me, who is your Imam? We have an answer. Who is your Imam? Al-Nisa Puri records as well, the stars are a harbour for the denizens, i.e. the inhabitants of the heavens, so that if they fade, they will meet that which they will promise. So I am a harbour to my companions as long as I live. If I pass, they will meet that which they will promise. And so is my household a harbour for my nation. If they were to perish, it will meet that which it was promised. Which is a very similar hadith that we have attributed to Imam al-Baqir, where he's reported to say, if the Imam were removed from the earth, it would thrash its inhabitants like the sea thrashes its inhabitants again pointing to the fact that at any given time there must be an imam from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala not an imam that the people have elected so again we ask who is your imam we have one in mind we're just bringing Quranic and Hadith concepts here that are telling us you need to have an answer and you need to have a godly answer not a man-made answer in Dua al we recite the line, where is the lifeline linking the denizens of the earth to the God on high? Where is he? We allude to him in Dua al of course, alluding to our weighted saviour. So that is the first point, that there must be an imam for every era and that is clear cut in Quran and Hadith. So you need to have an answer for that. Keep that in mind, detectives. The second is the concept of the 12 imams, which perhaps could be, could be, a description of a character that fits the profile we're looking for. In Sahih Muslim, the Holy Prophet is reported to say the religion will continue to be established until the determined hour of the day of judgment or you are led by 12 successors, all of whom are from Quraysh. If you can show us any other 12 individuals from Quraysh that kind of fit this category, we'd be happy to see it. Because they definitely sound like they fit the criteria for the Imam that we need to have for our time. Successes are not those who will come to power by, fo by force or arms, by the way. It's true successes, divinely appointed successes. And Ibn Kathir, a Sunni Maliki scholar, in his tafsir on this line, says apparently this includes the Mahdi who was promised in the narrations that mention him and tell us that his name is the same as the Holy Prophet. Now we know Imam al-Mahdi's actual name is Muhammad. Pretty compelling. More proof. Again, remember we said we're adding different probabilities together to eventually see what have we got on the table. Is it likely that we have an individual that's going to reappear? That his name is Muhammad? That he'll j establish justice and equity in the world? And if so, then we need to be prepared for him. The third thing that we bring to the table is by looking at the Old and New Testaments of the Bible. What? The Bible. Yes, the Bible. Even before Islam, the book of Isaiah and Revelation and in the Gospel of John under the Greek name Perikletos, the praised one or Muhammad. Al-Qadi al-Sabati who is a convert from Christianity and now a Hanafi Muslim, he says the description does not apply to any theory except of that of the Imamiyyah in regards to the existence of Muhammad ibn al-Hasan as the 12th Imam. So we've got additional evidence to the table. We then look back to the 3rd century after Hijra, during the occultation. So we're talking roughly around 260 after Hijra until 329 after Hijra. And we understand that there were four ambassadors representing the Imam of our time. Uthman ibn Sa'id, his son Muhammad ibn Uthman, Hussein ibn Ruh, 
and Ali ibn Muhammad al samri Four naibs, four representatives of our awaited saviour that are found in history. If the Imam was not real, surely these four individuals would have been tarnished or rubbished or even challenged in history. We can see that in history doesn't hold back. People will dispute if they think something's wrong. But when we look back in history, we don't find any notable scholars from all Muslim denominations at the time denying the birth or the ghaybah. Surely that would have been the right time to deny it. But if it's common fact that one of our dear uncles here has had a son, no one here is going to deny it. It's common fact, it's normal. If you go back to the Shi'i classical scholars of Hadith, al Kulaini, Ibn Babawai al Qummi, Ibn Qawlawai, all recorded signings, um, all recording sightings of the Imam. And there were so many that it reached that threshold of Tawatir again, that so many different people are saying that this event has happened, therefore it's very likely that it would have happened. Surely that would have been the time to challenge it. Even during the Ghaybah, we find that the Imam would write and sign a number of letters with the same handwriting, yet that doesn't get challenged. But suddenly, years, years, years later, people start to panic. Oh no, we didn't challenge it at the time. This theory is now looking more and more true. Now we'll begin to write and try and dispute it. Dude, your guys didn't do it back then, so why are you now panicking later on? Just admit. Just admit. Interestingly, if you then even want to critique that these four ambassadors knew each other, fine, the first two were father and son. The third and the fourth were unrelated. If the Imam wasn't present, how could they all be fabricating letters in the exact same handwriting over a period of 69 years and no one catching the mistake? We're just being rational here. We're just looking into history through a detective's lens. And our scholars received these letters and they accepted them without hesitation, perhaps because it was so clear. We've got no reports of scrutinizing narrations of these signed letters. And even if you go and analyze the chains, you'll then even realize actually the authorship must actually be valid, that this actually comes from our awaited savior. Another point that we add into this, we now have textual evidence, i.e. that we have many numerous Sahih narrations that point to the Imam's birth in the likes of Al-Kafi and Manla, part of the original Shia books. Imam Al-Kadhim reported to say, Say in sajda to shukr, O Allah, notes Imam Al-Kadhim before our awaited saviour, Say in sajda to shukr, O Allah, I witness to you and ask your angels, prophets, messengers, and all creation to witness that you, O oh Allah, you are my Lord, that Islam is my religion, and that Muhammad is my prophet, and that Ali, Al-Hassan, Al-Hussein, Ali ibn Al-Hussein, Muhammad ibn Ali, Ja'far ibn Muhammad, Musa ibn Ja'far, Ali ibn Musa, Muhammad ibn Ali, Ali ibn Muhammad, Al-Hassan ibn Ali, and the Hujjah, the son of Al-Hassan, of Ali, are my leaders. And I vow, Allahumma salla ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad wa jafar wa And I vow allegiance to them and forswear their enemies. The Imam is even mentioned before his birth. No one's challenging. Let's look at genealogists. They also concur. They're the experts in their area. What are, that's their opinion. When they analyze the family of the Hashemites, there are at least 17 non 12 gene genealogists that testify to the birth of a child named Muhammad to Imam al-Hassan al-Askari alayhi salam. And the book that I'm citing from is written by Sayyid Munir al-Khabaz and in that book he lists all of these individuals as well. I, no point in me reading them out just now but if you'd like the references please come and see me after and I can, give, I can give you access to the book. Then even if you look to historians, many historians have recorded from all different denominations his birth and occultation. And that list is even greater. And again, you can look at that in Sayyid Munir's book where he cites it. So, your boss comes in. He's like, what have you found out? Oh, detective. These guys are claiming that there is a man named Muhammad. And that he is the son of a man named Hassan. 
and that he's said to be the representative of Allah on this earth and that he's meant to be an individual that will bring around justice and equity in the world in the same way that it was filled with injustice and inequality as prophesied by his supposed great 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 grandfather the prophet of Islam what do you think is it legit or is it not now for those of you who have done statistics at school I let you do the numbers but we have one proof in the Imam for every era we have a second proof citing the 12 Imams we have a third proof using the Old and New Testaments of the Bible. We have a fourth proof looking back on the third century after Hijrah. We have a fifth proof looking at textual evidences. We have a sixth proof looking at the genealogist's concurrences. And we have a seventh proof looking at the historian's arguments. Many of those aren't related. They're from different academic disciplines. They're from Shi'i sources, non-Shi'i sources, non-Muslim sources, Sources at the time, sources thereafter from different disciplines. Now you tell me, does your intellect submit to the existence of this man and his imminent arrival to come and solve the world that we currently live in? Any reasonable and objective individual that calculates the possibilities derived from the corroboration of all of these evidences would obviously rightly, rightfully conclude in the certainty in the existence of Al Qa'im min Ali Muhammad. So intellectually, you submit. You submit. And if anyone wants to challenge it, remember what we said on the first or second night. They can come and dismantle each of those arguments first before they present their proofs. Let them go through each of these proofs first, dismantle each of them, debate it, and then we can look at the alternative. Ah, oh, the Mahdi may exist, but he's not born yet. Hello, we've already found proofs for it. Ah, maybe the Mahdi is not from Quraysh. Hello, we've already proved it. Ah, but the Mahdi is a Shia made thing. Hello, we looked at Shia, Sunni, non Muslim sources. Oh, the Mahdi has just come from you guys being in fear. Hello, we've rubbished that argument as well. So on and so on and so on. So now you let your intellect submit. And when your intellect submits, everything submits thereafter, hopefully. Your heart begins to submit as well. But even if we put aside the evidence and the textual support, even if you put that aside, intellectual proofs will support the promised day of salvation. And we'll look at two briefly before our Messiah for this evening. Firstly, the philosophical dimension. When you look at the line in Surah Al-Mulk, الَّذِي خَلَقَ الْمَوْتِ وَالْحَيَاتِ لِيَبْلُوَكُمْ أَيُّكُمْ أَحْسَنُ عَمَلًا وَهُوَ الْعَزِيزُ الْغَفُورُ He who created death and life that he may test you to see which of you is best in conduct and he is the Almighty, the All-Forgiving. What we see is that the community of man, their aim is to try and strive to achieve excellence, right? We're trying to get as close to Allah as we can, to create the best society amongst creation as we can. That looks like what? It's when we see the triumph of justice and virtue over oppression and vice. When we see the eradication of poverty, when we see the eradication of hunger, when we see the eradication of inequality and so on and so on and so on. If this is the goal, then there must be a day when this is eventually achieved. Otherwise, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has created something meaningless. And we know that Allah does not act without purpose. So philosophically, if Allah is saying this day is coming where we're going to see this perfect society created, it has to come one day. So philosophically, this day must be coming at some point. And we've been honored with prophets, with holy scriptures, with immaculate leaders as guidance whilst we try to when we strive to achieve this goal. And one day we'll achieve it and fulfill this promise that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions in the Quran in 21105. Certainly we wrote in the Psalms and the Torah, indeed our righteous servants shall inherit the earth. They'll govern it. They'll run it. They'll run the cosmos on behalf of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And they'll create this perfect cosmic civilization that we are all yearning for to be a part of. So intellectually now, 
we know that this promised day is going to fall upon the earth. But even if you look at it from a social dimension now as well, you would, if you look back at history, you see that history has a repeating kind of trajectory. It doesn't progress randomly, but it's based on social and historical patterns. There's a concept in history of survival of the fittest. Meaning what? There are economic injustices that happen in society after society. Suddenly people in society, a certain group, will run out of food. They'll fall into hunger. At some point they say enough is enough. They'll then revolt. They'll get some movement in that kind of, uh, in that uprising. They'll dislodge that leader. The next amazing guy turns up and in 50 years time, his party does the same thing. Next guy rises up, next one. Then there's, there's, a, there's a collaboration between two countries. It just keeps happening. And somehow, no matter what country you look at in the world right now, regardless of which one, you will see a, an amount of people in that country suffering in poverty. We know it's true. We looked at the statistics at the start. Prophet Nuh السلام, even led a revolution against fear and hunger in his time. And his, fo his followers were predominantly the oppressed and the destitute. And this is the same for a lot of the prophets and the reformers. And even secular scholars like Einstein agree to this concept that history is like this. One civilization, it crumbles. The next, it crumbles. The next, it crumbles. At some point, society is going to wake up and be like, you know what? We just haven't got the answer. Capitalism, not working very well at all. Massively right-wing ideologies, haven't worked so well. Massively left-wing socialism, also not working so well. Some amalgamation of the mix in the middle, not sure it exists. At some point, mankind's going to run out of ideas. But we know Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has promised a day where we're going to see this thing work perfectly. And that is the revolution that we're looking for. We have this massive misconception that when we talk about the revolution of our awaited saviour, the first words that come into our head are, 313 soldiers, army, guns, military. Okay, 313 is valid. But it's not just straight up war. How can we prove that? We'll look at that tomorrow, inshallah. But just a glimpse of it. Just look at the way that the Holy Prophet, Rahmatullah Alameen, how did he go about his work? How did Imam al Hussein salam, go about his work? Imam al Hussein salam, leads a revolution to enjoin good. And forbid what and forbid that which is evil. Against oppressors who used hunger and fear to reign over a population. The Umayyads were grim individuals. They used the nation's wealth for their own selfish purposes. And the Imam stood up against this tyranny. He called out falsehood when he saw it. And this is a similar theme amongst all of the Ahl al Bayt. And this will be the same for our awaited Saviour. So you, Mu'mineen, Mu'minat, have been presented with some proofs about the existence of the re-emergence and identity of our awaited saviour. So you now decide on the following two points. Do you now believe or do you have more certainty in your belief that he is already alive? And secondly, do you believe or do you have more certainty in your belief? that he will return to establish justice on earth and bring about this perfect society. If you decide yes to both of those questions, which I hope you do, then you've got another decision to make. Do you want to be part of that revolution with him? You can't say anymore, oh, it's just a fantasy that we do this to al hujja at the end of ziyara. Oh, say salam to your 12th Imam. We've just proven it, if you agree with the proofs. And if you don't, then you need to go and research yourself. So you now need to decide, do I want to be part of that revolution or not? And if so, then we need to know what it takes to be a part of it. You can't stroll up and just join that revolution for fun. You need to be a certain type of person. And to understand that, we can take inspiration from those who joined the revolution of Hussein alayhi salam. What qualities, what characteristics, what individuals, what men, what men, what women, what children were in that revolution of Imam al Hussein alayhi salam, which we'll look at tomorrow, inshallah. <coughs> With the Masaib, I've been asked to give a little bit of historical context around 
what was happening at that time as Imam Hussein alayhi salam was heading towards Karbala. So I just want to give a little bit of context for you so that you can begin to appreciate the challenge that Imam Hussein alayhi salam felt. And perhaps for us to realize that if we want to be part of this revolution, it's not going to be straightforward. History tells us that we've got noble companions of the Imam who were not with him, perhaps in different cities versus where he was at that time, moving from Medina to Mecca and then across to, uh, from Mecca to Medina and then across to Karbala. So he had different companions and messengers going between cities, transferring letters, for example, between him and those in Kufa. And these individuals being killed by the enemies of Allah, left, right and center. As soon as they would get a hold of one of these guys, you're finished. Qais ibn Mushir was sent to the Kufans with a letter from Imam Hussein alayhi salam informing the Kufans of Imam Hussein's imminent arrival. And this was in reply to Mustab ibn Aqil's letter which he sent 27 days before his martyrdom. And when Qais reached an area called al qadisiyya he was arrested and sent to Ubaidullah ibn Ziyad. He was taken to the top of that palace or mansion and Qais, look at this conviction that he has, facing death facing death and I'm sure myself included we haven't heard of Qais since today or maybe just a small percentage of us have look at his conviction for a man who isn't even known that well in history he's reported to say oh people without doubt al Hussein is the best of God's creation he is the son of Fatima the daughter of God's messenger I am his messenger to you I left him at al hajar so respond to his call. He then cursed Ibn Ziyad and his father and sought Allah's forgiveness for Imam Ali alayhi salam. And Ibn Ziyad then orders him to be thrown down from the roof of the mansion. They threw him down, his body breaks and he dies from his injuries. We then learn the story, the famous story of the legend that is Mustafa ibn Aqil alayhi salam and his brutal death in Kufa alongside Hani ibn Urwa, who some of you would have visited both of them in the holy city of Kufa. And look at the response of the sons of Aqil when they hear of Muslims' death, i.e. Muslims' brothers. They're reported to say, we have no desire to live after our brother Muslim and we will not turn back even if we're killed. Imam Hussein salam, speaks of Muslim by saying there is no goodness left in life after the death of such men. Can you imagine this awaited savior that we've been discussing this evening saying about you, there is no goodness left in life after the death of a man like you? What it takes to be at that level. How much character building it takes to be at that level. How much yaqeen it takes to be at that level. This doesn't just come through the basics. This comes through more investment in this path to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Abu Razin Sulaiman was a servant of Imam alayhi salam. In fact, sorry, we'll go back a step. Imam alayhi salam reaches an area called Zubala. And he then receives the news of the shahadah of an individual known as Abdullah ibn Yaqtur. Imam gave the news to the caravan and gave the people the opportunity to leave at this point. Because they started to hear like all of the Imam's companions that they haven't even reached Karbala. And all these guys are being killed left, right and center. He's like, look guys, if you want to jump, you can jump. And guess what? People left. And Imam alayhi salam, despite being told all of these guys are passing away, thinking, okay, maybe now I've got these companions. No, they're still jumping. Until only there were men who had accompanied him from Medina and a small group of men who had joined him after they later remained. Abu Razin Sulaiman was a servant of Imam alayhi salam. He was known as Sulaiman Mawla of Hussein. He was the first martyr in this movement of the Imam Alaihissalam in this revolution. He carried the letter that the Imam wrote to the leaders of Basra seeking their support. And it got leaked to Ibn Ziyad and Sulaiman again. He was summoned and killed. So what do we see here? The time was absolutely brutal. And I just want you to spare a moment of thought for Imam Hussein Alayhi I don't think we usually discuss this in the Masaib. That even before reaching Karbala, they're under attack. Everything's under attack. 
Imagine that you've left your hometown and you find out your friends in different cities are being killed by your enemies. Tell me, do you not start worrying about the family you've left back in Medina? I ask you, where does Hussein's heart go at this point in time? Many of you are leaders of businesses in this community. You know when things get difficult, everyone looks to the leader, right? You feel that pressure. This guy resigns, this person falls ill, that deal goes under. Everyone's looking at Imam Hussein alayhi salam. Muslim's dead, your messenger's dead, another messenger's dead. You've asked everyone to stay, many have left. What about the people back in Medina? Are we still going to Karbala Hussein? Look at the conviction of Hussein alayhi salam. Look at the unwavering support of his companions at this point in time as well. The resilience he has even before Ashura started. You can't help but think about this loneliness that Hussein alayhi salam must feel at this point. He's traveling, he's not at home. He doesn't get a good night's sleep back in his own room. He's on a mission having to handle tribulation after tribulation. Then in the same way that Imam al-Hussein gives opportunity to those traveling with him to jump ship, and some did. The question is, is this Imam whose existence we've proved today, if he were to ask us, hey Sadiq, do you wanna stick around? Or are you jumping ship? What am I doing at this very moment? Hey Sadiq, just give up that habit of yours. Am I jumping ship or am I sticking to the habit? Hey Sadiq, just pray your salah if you can. Am I going to start praying or am I jumping ship? There's no chance I can pick up a metaphorical sword and fight for the Imam if I'm unable to do the basics for him or for in, in Qutigit Qurbatan illallah. No way. Hey Sadiq, give up that backbiting you're so massively addicted to. Am I going to do it or am I going to jump ship? You and I, all of us, in the last two nights have identified things we need to work on. We've established today that this awaited saviour is imminently coming and he will have supporters and we want to be like his supporters. But we're also aware that the ghurba that he faces is severe because many of his so-called companions are jumping ship day after day after day. History tells us, many sources in history tell us that Imam alayhi salam eventually arrives in the holy city of Karbala on the second of Muharram, 61 after Hijra, 680 in the Gregorian calendar. And it's reported in Al-Manaqib by Ibn Shahr Ashab that when the Imam arrived, he stopped at this holy land of Karbala. And may Allah grant us the ziyara of Karbala. Imam al Hussein is reported to arrive in the land of Karbala. He's reported to say this is the place of sorrow and affliction, the land of Karb and Bala. This is where our mounts will be stabled. This is where we will make our camps. This is where our men will be killed. And this is where our blood will be spilt. The Imam does something phenomenal when he arrives in Karbala and it just shows just how ready he was for this mission. He writes a letter to his brother Muhammad ibn Ali al Hanafiya and the men of Banu Hashim. Imagine your last WhatsApp message to your family members if you knew you were going to be murdered in eight days' time. What would you write? I love you, I miss you. No, 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 no. What does the Imam write in this letter? In the name of Allah, the Beneficent, the Merciful, from Al Hussein ibn Ali to Muhammad ibn Ali and the rest of Banu Hashim, it is as if the world never existed and the hereafter has always been there. Peace. Just look at the conviction of the Imam. This world never existed. That's what it takes to be in that gang. That's what it takes to be in that revolution. You have yaqeen about this awaited savior. You have yaqeen, intellectual yaqeen at least. 
Imam is saying it is as if the world never existed and the hereafter has always been here. Am I ready to not even give up this dunya, rather to not even think that it even existed? And it was only about the akhirah. But how did Imam Hussain know that Karbala was the land where the trouble was going to happen? We understand from Umar Salma that one day Allah's Messenger was sitting in her apartment and he instructed her, do not let anyone to enter. I kept watch, but in the meantime, Al Hussein alayhi salam entered. Then I heard the sound of Allah's messenger weeping. I went to check and saw that Al Hussein was sitting in his lap, and the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi had placed his hand on his own forehead and was weeping. I exclaimed, By Allah, I didn't know when he entered. He said, Jibra'il alayhi salam was with us in the room. He asked me, Do you love him? Then I replied, I love him more than anyone in this world He said Your nation shall kill him in a land called Karbala Jibra'il had produced some soil from that land And given it to him And the Prophet Sallallahu showed it to her Years afterwards when Hussein was so Surrounded before being killed, he asked, What is the name of this place? They said, Karbala. He replied, Allah and His Messenger spoke the truth. This is indeed the land of Karb, of sorrow and Bala, affliction. O oh, Hussein, why is this land for you known? as sorrow and affliction. O oh, Hussein, is it because of the ghurba, the loneliness that you felt when you arrived in Karbala? Or is it because of the loneliness you felt when you lost the Habib? Or is it because of the loneliness you felt when you lost your brother son al or is it because of the loneliness you felt when you lost your dear Ali and al -Akbar, who reminded you of the face and the voice of Rasulullah? Or is it because of the loneliness you felt when you lost Abbas? <laughs> Or is it because of the loneliness you felt when you lost Ali and Al Azhar? Oh, oh, Hussein, I ask you, I ask you as a father to a father, was it because of the loneliness when you felt when you left Sukaina as you went into the battlefield? <laughs> Oh, oh Hussein, is this land known as Karabin Wabala, as sorrow and affliction for what would then happen to Zainab after your death? But oh Hussein, in the same way that we have the yaqeen of your ghurba in Karbala, we have yaqeen of the ghurba of our awaited Savior, knowing that he is eagerly awaiting to restore justice and avenge your martyrdom. But for you, Hussein, at this moment where we feel the sourness of this ghurba that you felt, we pledge our allegiance to you. We pledge our lifelong companionship to you. And five times we shout with the top of our voices, Labayka ya Hussein. Ha! Labayka ya! Hussein, le baïka ya Hussein, le baïka ya Hussein, le baïka ya Hussein, inna lillahi wa inna ilayhi raji'oon. Wa sayyalamu al-lazina zalamu ayyamun qalabiyan qalibun. Wa l'aqibatu lil-muttaqeen. Ma'atama Hussein, ya Hussein.
يا حسين 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 يا